All right. It is good to be back in Seattle. Uh, I don't know if this, this wasn't in my bio, but I did my PhD here. I lived here for six years. So I love Seattle. Um, my name is Sam Woolley, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we face in the current war of propaganda and disinformation and what has colloquially become known as fake news. Uh, I'm going to challenge us all to not say the term fake news from here on out because basically fake news itself has been weaponized by the powers that be to spread fake news. Uh, so uh, a lot of people study disinformation. And a lot of people study disinformation in a lot of different ways. Computer scientists can map relationships between people to the millionth degree. Statisticians uh, can model behavior uh, and make predictions about what's to come. Hopefully they get it a little bit better than they did in 2016 this time around. Uh, and uh, people like me talk to other people. I travel and uh, do ethnography. So a lot of people tend to think when they first meet me or when they speak to me, this includes some of my colleagues at Texas, uh, that I'm a quantitative researcher, that I'm a computer scientist, or that I'm a statistician. And the fact is, that's not true. I'm a, I'm a person that travels around the world and talks to the people who make and build these things. I talk to the people who make and build bots, uh, automated, automated software on, on uh, the internet that gets used to do tasks repetitively. Specifically, I focus on people that talk, make political bots. So the people who build these automated programs that look like real people on social media that, use, that get used to spread vitriol and garbage and manipulate public opinion. Um, more recently, I've begun to study disinformation and misinformation. Since about 2013, I've been doing that. And it's been a wild ride, let me tell you. Um, up until 2016, my colleagues and I, including a lot of the folks who are going to be at University of Washington at the Center for Informed Public, um, were banging on the doors of social media companies and asking them to pay attention to what we were calling computational propaganda. We had money from the National Science Foundation to study this thing as early as 2013. We knew that powerful political actors around the world, including Russia, but also including people domestically, were using manipulative tactics on social media, including bots and amplification, in attempts to manipulate the algorithms on social media and to manipulate people in order to get them to be polarized, in order to get them to disengage, in order to get them to be angry, you name it, it was there. It didn't happen. Now it is beginning to happen and there's reason for hope and I'm gonna get into that and I'm gonna talk to you about solutions tonight and what, what is actually going on. Um, and uh, I guess I'll start off with just saying, you know, uh, through all of this research and all of this stuff that I see every day in my own work, uh, I end with uh, hope. I do end with hope. And I feel a bit optimistic about where we are right now and where we're going. And uh, I want to share that with you up front. So, um, despite the uh, provocative subtitle, um, which you can thank my editor for. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, um, so I want to introduce you to four places, four people, and four ideas that have been integral in helping me to write this book. I'm gonna take you in a little bit on a, on a little bit of a journey into uh, the process of how this book came to be and uh, why I wanted to write it, okay? So the first person, and actually the first place is Seattle, here. Seattle 2013, um, and a guy named Phil, who was my mentor and advisor for my PhD. Phil uh, is who this book is dedicated to, um, he taught me how to be a researcher uh, while always allowing space for me to be myself. That's exactly what I say here. Um, and he encouraged me to do this work. It was with Phil and a few other collaborators at the University of Washington that we created the idea of the Computational Propaganda Project. It was with Phil and this team that we first began to realize that bots were manipulating our democracy and manipulating social media. Phil taught me that technology is integral to politics. It's not really a shocker, but he taught me that we should focus on this stuff. He had just spent uh, several years studying the Arab Spring. He'd been in Tunisia and North Africa, throughout the Middle East, and he'd written a book called The Digital Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy. Great title, a lot of these. Um, and Phil's argument basically was that social media had played a sort of cautiously optimistic, in Phil's terms, role in the Arab Spring. But something else was happening then too. And it wasn't until after Phil had written this book that he realized 
hmm, I'm starting to see some manipulation going on on social media. That's where I came in. Uh, I had been spending an inordinate amounts of time on social media. I was a 2012 uh, fellow for the Obama campaign um, and learned a lot about the digital techniques that campaigns were using to attract voters, but also to contact real people. Um, but I'd also noticed that there was a lot of false looking, fake, weird accounts on Twitter and Facebook. And uh, I know you all saw those too, right? You're always wondering who is Jonathan365581, whatever. Um, and why are they sending me messages about politics? Um, it turns out that this was organized. This was an organized movement. And Phil taught me how to track this stuff. Phil taught me how to think about this stuff critically, and he taught me how to research it. It was really challenging. What we landed upon wasn't the idea that we should track this stuff quantitatively. We shouldn't gather all the data from Twitter and Facebook and analyze it and then tell you all, well, there was 100,000 tweets during the debates that uh, supported Donald Trump. No. What we wanted to do was we actually wanted to get out into the field, go to Turkey, go to Brazil, go to Singapore, and talk to the people who were making and building propaganda campaigns and ask them, who were they working for? Why were they doing what they were doing? How were they doing what they were doing? And so, the second person I want to introduce you to in the second place is someone named Andrew, and the place is, is Oxford. Actually, I met Andrew a few weeks before we re-met in Oxford for an, a formal interview. I met him at London School of Economics. By that time, I had moved from University of Washington in the midst of my PhD to go to University of Oxford to manage a research team called the Computational Propaganda Project with Phil. Phil had taken a job there as well. And we built out a team with a grant from the European Research Council to specifically study the way that Russia was using propaganda to uh, infiltrate European democracy over social media. It was pretty cutting edge stuff and it was really, really exciting. I met this guy, Andrew, at this conference at, L at LSE. And Andrew said to me, hey, um, I, I want to talk to you about something. And I, I kind of could tell he was hesitant and I was a little worried. <laughs> and he said, I, um, I build political bots. And I said, oh, really? OK. And this was one of the first times I had like, met someone that was really like, coming to me that I wasn't having to chase down. And he said, yeah, I, um, I actually build political bots for the, the British Labor Party. And uh, not for them, but I build them um, uh, on their behalf. <laughs> they don't know. Um, but but uh, you know, I have, I have hundreds, if not thousands, of bots that are online right now supporting different people in the Labor Party, uh, just basically built to spread messages in support of them or to kind of take down opposition or to spread articles about them and things like that. And I was like, whoa, this is, this is really crazy. Could we talk? Sure enough, yes, he said yes, we could talk. We ended up um, talking quite a lot and uh, getting to know each other and we formed an unlikely friendship, sort of, <laughs> which is strange, you know? Um, and uh, eventually what, what Andrew taught me was that there's always a person behind the technology. There's always a person behind the bot. There's sort of a, a need for people to think a lot of the time that algorithms or math or science, uh, social media, this technology, that it's, it's ideology free, you know? Maybe not the social media thing, we all know that by now. But algorithms and bots are laden with the beliefs of the people who build them, as is science, you know? We try to mitigate our own, our own ideas when conducting an experiment, but we're not always successful. I think the best scientists, the best technologists, are people that know they come with bias and attempt to correct for it. The problem with the social media companies now is there was no attempt to correct for the biases that were implicit. Profit, one of them. Engagement, massive engagement. Obsession, another one of them. So Alex showed me that when I thought about bots, what I was really thinking about and what I should really be talking about was people. I should really be talking about the people who are behind this. And so one of the things that's gonna come up again, and I'll talk about it in my reading, is that there are people that are actually responsible for what's going on. There are people that are responsible for propaganda campaigns. There's PR companies, BuzzFeed News, fantastic new article on BuzzFeed News, catalogs over, I think, 70 different dark, they call them dark PR firms, that have built botnets and armies for political campaigns, for all kinds of groups around the world, and sold this as a service. I mean, a lot of these, these botnets are being used to attack protected groups. 
they're being used to, uh, to spread misinformation and disinformation about voting and where you vote and when you vote. And oftentimes in 2016, that disinformation or misinformation about where or when you vote was going to African Americans. It was going to minority communities who are already underserved in this democracy. Um, and so, you know, there's people behind the bots, but there's also people who are targets of the bots. The third person I want to introduce, introduce you to and the third place is a woman named Marina. And the place is Palo Alto. After being at Oxford for a few years, I really thought that my time would be better served being in the United States. Um, I understand the political system here a lot better. Um, I miss my family. I got married to an American girl from Oregon. Um, and so, you know, I thought, I'm going to come back to the US. And, and I had a few options, and I ended up, I had a false flag where I almost went to Facebook. They offered me a job, and I accepted it. And then I was like, what am I doing? I'm not going to Facebook. This is insane. <laughs> Guarantee this book would not exist had I gone to Facebook. The salary, you know? And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to talk about public interest technologists and why we need them. Um, but anyway, so I decided to go to a 50-year-old think tank called the Institute for the Future, based in Palo Alto. Uh, Institute for the Future did some really early work on, on the NSFnet and the ARPANET, what became the internet. And there's a lot of really interesting people who are pioneers behind the internet that are there. And I thought, this would be a great place to go. Lots of connections to Stanford and Berkeley. Spend some time thinking about the future the future of this stuff. It was while I was at Institute for the Future that I wrote The Reality Game. And The Reality Game is purposefully focused on the future. Marina taught me how to focus on the future, but she taught me something else that I think is even more important. Marina is from Ukraine. She moved to the States uh, in the midst of the Soviet era. And I met Marina actually the day after Trump got elected. I flew from New York where I was following the Trump and Clinton campaigns and went to Palo Alto for a meeting with Deputy Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken and uh, one of the chief AI scientists at IBM, Grady Booch, and, and Marina and a few other people. And we were thinking about what can we do about the current situation on social media? Because it was becoming apparent to a few people that it was a really big problem even then. It had been happening before, but even then in the government. Um, and so Marina said, listen, I want to tell you all a story about growing up in the Soviet Union and what it was like to experience media then. The long story short was that in the Soviet Union, propaganda ruled supreme. I mean, that's not a surprise to us. We see the propaganda posters that are actually kind of beautiful from the Soviet Union, but uh, terrifying. Um, and Marina said, lots of what we see right now, uh, lots of this propaganda, these are Cold War tactics. These are tactics that have been around since the Cold War and arguably before. What's different about these things that are happening is that technology is facilitating their amplification. It's facilitating their automation. And so the size and scale of the problem has become worse. People are anonymous now online. It has benefits, but it also has consequences. It means that activists in Saudi Arabia who are fighting for democracy can be anonymous online, but it also means that people who are building massive botnets can attack you anonymously, and people like me can't track them. So Marina taught me to use the history to think about the future. Our institutions aren't broken. Democracy's not dead. I'm here to tell you. I'm going to read you a quote at the end of this talk, and you'll see the quote at the beginning of the book about democracy being a work in progress always. And so Marina taught me to think about the, think about the past. I mean, think about things like the printing press and the Hundred Years' War that came after it, and how information coming into the hands of the people was a big deal and caused a lot of problems then. And it's happened then, and we can deal with it now by looking back to then. So uh, the fourth person, fourth and final person, is Kathleen. And Kathleen uh, is my boss at the University of Texas. She is a former dining editor at the New York Times, and uh, I think she was weekend editor at some point there. And before that, she was a sports journalist, so she's awesome. I love hanging out with her. And in the short time I've known her, her sort of inf infectious enthusiasm and her zeal for, for journalism has taught me to restore, like to, to reinvigorate my own faith in institutions, specifically in journalism. Journalism is not 
broken. We don't need to recreate journalism. Journalism is there. If there's one thing I know about this country and about the politics of it from studying it during my PhD and before that, uh, it's that it's, you know, politics here is a pendulum. It swings back and forth. And at the moment, we're going through a massive time of disinformation, misinformation, mistrust in institutions. It's at an all-time low in most institutions. But that's going to change. And the young people that I teach at the University of Texas that are journalists are absolutely phenomenal. And they're thinking about these problems in brand new ways. We don't need to create a new journalism. We need to reinvigorate the journalism that we have. We need to hold the social media companies accountable and make them give money to journalism, which they helped to attempt to destroy. We need to get money back in the hands of organizations, uh, get more money in the hands of organizations like Wikipedia, who are basically doing the work of the social media companies without any compensation. So all of these things taken together have brought me to think about what's coming next. So if we've seen bots being used, if we've seen, uh, if we've seen powerful propaganda campaigns that were automated, how will artificial intelligence be used? How will VR be used, virtual reality? How will deep fake videos, which I'm sure you've all read about, be used? Good questions. I'm going to read a little bit. Anytime you log on to Twitter and look at a popular post, you're likely to find bot accounts liking or commenting on it. Clicking through, you'll see they've tweeted many times, often in a short span. Sometimes their posts are selling junk or spreading digital viruses. Other accounts, especially the boss, bots that post garbled vitriol in response to particular news articles or official statements, are entirely political. It's easy to assume this entire, entire phenomenon is powered by advanced computer science. Indeed, I've talked to many people who think machine learning algorithms driven by artificial intelligence are giving political bots the ability to learn from their surroundings and interact with people in a sophisticated way. During events in which researchers now believe political bots and disinformation played a key role, the Brexit referendum, the Trump-Clinton contest of 2016, the Crimea crisis, there is a widespread belief that smart AI tools allowed computers to pose as humans and help manipulate the public conversation. Pundits and journalists have fueled this. There have been provocative stories about the rise of AI propaganda machines and stories claiming that artificial intelligence has conquered democracy. Even my own research into social media, into how social media is used to mold public opinion, hack the truth and silence protest, what's known as computational propaganda, has been quoted in articles that suggest our robot overlords are already here. The reality, though, is that Complex mechanisms like artificial intelligence played little role in computational propaganda campaigns to date. Little role. All of the evidence I've seen on Cambridge Analytica suggests the firm never launched the psychographic marketing tools it claimed to possess during the 2016 election. Though it said it could target individuals with specific messages based on personality profiles derived from controversial Facebook databases, which they did have. And I met Cambridge Analytica before they worked for Trump. When I was at the Oxford Internet Institute, meanwhile, we looked into whether Twitter bots were being used during the Brexit debate. We found that while many were being used to spread messages about the Leave campaign, the vast majority of automated accounts were very simple. They were made to alter online conversation with bots that had been built simply to boost likes or follows, just to like stuff, to spread links to game trends, or in some cases to troll the opposition with just a lot of garbage. It was gamed by small groups of human users who understood the magic of memes and virality of seeding conspiracies online and watching them grow. Conversations were blocked by basic bot-generated spam and noise, purposefully attached to particular hashtags in order to demobilize online conversations. Links to news articles that showed a politician in a particular light were hyped by fake or proxy accounts made to boost and repost the same junk over and over and over. These campaigns were wielded bluntly. These bots were not designed to be functionally conversational. You could figure out it was a bot within about two sentences. They did not harness AI. 
There are, however, signals that AI generated computational propaganda and disinformation are beginning to be used. Hackers and other groups have already begun testing the effectiveness of more dangerous AI bots over social media. A 2017 piece from Gizmodo reported that two data scientists taught an artificial intelligence to design its own phishing campaign. In tests, the artificial hacker was substantively better than the human competitors, composing and distributing more phishing tweets to humans and at a substantively better conversion rate. Problematic content is not spread only now by machine learning AI, polit AI political bots, though. Nor are problematic uses or designs of technology being generated only by social media firms. Research has pointed out that machine learning can be tainted by poison attacks. Malicious actors influence training data in order to change the results of a given algorithm. Basically, they get in before the algorithm's even been launched. They manipulate the training data. Khalif Litaru, a senior fellow at George Washington University, suggests that the first attacks driven by AI bots would not be aimed at social media, but instead would involve what's known as dis distributed denial of service attacks, DDoS attacks, which involves shutting down targeted web servers by flooding them with traffic. Imagine for a moment that you've handed a botnet over the control of a deep learning system and gave that AI algorithm complete control over every knob and dial of that botnet. Litaru writes, these efforts aren't geared towards helping news organizations vet heaps of content. Rather, they help multi-billion dollar companies keep their own house clean right now. You also give it live feeds of global internet status information from major cybersecurity monitoring vendors around the world so it can observe second by second how the victim and the rest of the internet at large is responding to the attack. Perhaps this all comes after you've had the algorithm spend several weeks monitoring the target in exquisite detail to understand the totality and nuance of its traffic patterns and behaviors and burrow its way through its outer layers of defenses. Beyond defense. In April 2018, Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, appeared before Congress. He was under the political microscope for the mishandling of user information during the 2016 election. In his two-part testimony, he mentioned artificial intelligence more than 30 times, suggesting that AI was going to be the solution to the problem of digital disinformation by providing programs that would combat the sheer volume of computational propaganda. He predicted then that in the next decade, AI would be the savior for the massive problems of scale that Facebook and others have come up against or cause when dealing with the global spread of junk content and manipulation. So, is there a way we could use AI or automated bot technology to tackle the manipulation of public opinion? Can we use AI to fight AI? Well, there are examples. The Observatory on Social Media in Indiana University has built public tools that harness machine learning to detect bots on social media by looking at over 1,200 features to determine whether it's more likely a human or a bot. And we use it all the time, myself and other researchers. Facebook product manager Tessa Lyons said in a 2018 announcement that machine learning helps Facebook identify duplicates of debunked stories. For example, a fact checker in France debunked a claim that you can save a person by having a stroke by using a needle to prick their finger and draw blood. You can't do that, by the way. This allowed us to identify over 20 domains and 1,400 links spreading the same claim. Pretty crazy. Oftentimes, computational propaganda campaigns are just really repetitive. In such cases, social media firms can harness machine learning to pick up and even verify fact checks from around the globe and use these evidence-driven corrections to flag bogus content. But there's a big debate in the academic community as to whether passively identifying potentially false information for social media users is actually effective or moral. Some researchers suggest that fact checking efforts, both online and offline, do not work very effectively in their current form. In early 2019, the fact-checking website Snopes, which had partnered with Facebook in such corrective efforts, broke off the relationship. In an interview with Pointer Institute, Snopes VP of Operations, Vinnie Green, said, it doesn't seem like we're striving to make third-party fact-checking more practical for publishers or users. It seems like we're striving to make it easier for Facebook. Organizations like Facebook continue to rely on small, usually nonprofits, to vet their bad content. 
Potentially false articles or videos are often passed to these groups with no background information on how or why Facebook or Google flagged them in the first place. These efforts aren't geared towards helping news organizations vet the heaps of content or leads they receive each day to help under-resourced reporters do better work. Rather, they help a multi-billion dollar company keep its own house clean in a post hoc fashion. It is time for Facebook to take responsibility internally for fact checking in some way, shape, or form, rather than passing off the task or verifying or debunking news reports to other groups. Facebook and other social media companies must also stop relying on fact, checker, fact, checker, fact checks after the fact, that is, only after a false article has gone viral. These, article, these companies need to generate some kind of early warning system for computational propaganda. Facebook, Google, and others like them employ people to find and take down content that contains violence and, or information from terrorist groups. They are much less zealous, however, in their efforts to get rid of outright disinformation. The plethora of different contexts in which false information flows online, everywhere from an election in India to major sporting event in South Africa, makes it tricky for AI to operate, operate on its own, absent any human knowledge. This takes a lot of nuance and human knowledge. But in the coming months and years, it will take hordes of people across the world to effectively vet the massive amount of content and countless circumstances that are going to arise, like Iran, like the impeachment process, like 2020. There simply is no easy fix to the problem of computational propaganda on social media. It is the company's responsibility, though, to find a way to fix this. So far, Facebook seems far more focused on PR than on regulating the flow of computational propaganda or graphic content. According to an article in The Verge, the company spends much more time celebrating its efforts to get rid of particular pieces of vitriol or violence than on systematically actually overhauling its moderation system. Thank you. So, uh, so, that's kind of ominous. <laughs> uh, the subtitle's kind of ominous. Um, and that's there for a reason. Uh, you know, it's meant to be provocative. I want people to think about the future and the ways in which the next wave of technology will break the truth. But if I'm successful here tonight, and if this book is successful, you'll prove me wrong. The next wave of technology won't break the truth, and I hope you do that. I really do. Something most people don't know, I'm just gonna go back, is that uh, the UK edition of the book that came out today, um, it, the subtitle is How the Next Wave of Technology Will Break the Truth and What We Can Do About It, which I quite like. <laughs> Got removed for the American version. Um, <laughs> there is hope, though, I'm here to tell you. Uh, and so I want to pivot to talking about solutions and to talking about what we can do, talking about where there's hope, talking about like the things that I know can make a difference now and now. The book is written with the idea that the actual next wave of technology has to be designed with human rights and democracy baked into the actual tools. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all of these tools were built with different things in mind. As I've said, profit became one of them through advertising and is now the biggest operative ethic. But engagement was a huge one. And, and we all know that that's become a major problem for society. What would technology look like? What would new social media platforms look like if we designed them with democracy in mind, the core tenets of democracy, small d, sort of? Or with human rights? Uh, with Jane McGonigal, who's a game designer and an author of Reality is Broken, a friend of mine and a colleague, um, I helped to design something called the Ethical Operating System. It's at ethicalos.org. You can access it for free. Um, at ethicalos.org, there is a toolkit that is built for technologists to help them ask questions about problems that may come up with technology as they're building it. It's already being deployed and has been deployed at Stanford's Intro to CS class. So young computer scientists are actually thinking about these things. Um, it's been used by a number of different companies in Silicon Valley and, and it's really exciting. It's actually challenging people to think about what will it look like when the next wave of social media arise? And it's actually challenging me to think that maybe, just maybe, 
Facebook and Twitter and you, YouTube will become legacy media as quickly as they became new media. So there's three things, three groups of people and three basic timelines here. There are users. What can users do? There are policymakers, government. What can the government do? There is companies. What can they do? And this is kind of oversimplified, but let's think about this. The first thing, and I'm not being facetious here, hard word, um, is that users uh, in the short term, in terms of timeline, can read the whole article. It might seem obvious to you all, but challenge your family, your friends, those that you know to actually read below the headline. I myself actually, you know, like get on social media all the time and read an article. I'm like, oh, that headline is so good. I'm going to share this. And I've done it, you know, and I've regretted it. When someone's like, did you know that article is just totally bullshit? You know? <laughs> um, people need to know that they have to engage with content. We already have science. We already know what critical thinking looks like. We should have critical thinking be a class in all high schools. Critical thinking should be required. Media, media literacy should be required. Information literacy should be required. We should be teaching young people and people over the age of 65, because actually, little secret everyone, in 2016, people over the age of 65 were the primary spreaders of mis and disinformation. A report from the NYU Social Media and Political Participation Lab showed that I think it was around over 70% of the content was actually spread by people uh, over the age of retirement in the United States. So we need some robust media literacy campaigns. Um, I have a friend who is, has a PhD <laughs> who uh, got contacted by a social media company after the 2016 election saying, uh, n you spread known uh, Russian propaganda. <laughs> And this person thought to themselves, I study this stuff, and I'm spreading it. So if people like us can spread it, it means that there needs to be more engagement and that we need to do more work. But it also means that the social media companies have a lot of work to do in vetting that content before it gets to us. The Russian government should not be able to spread political propaganda during American elections. That's just basic. That's against the law. Facebook has a lot to do, Google has a lot to do, and so do a lot of other companies. There's a lot of firms here. We haven't mentioned Amazon, we haven't mentioned Apple. Those companies have a lot to do. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are just a social media firm. If you are in the technology business at, right now, you have a hand in what's going on. And so companies can generate sensible self-regulation and are. I'm wary of self-regulation on its own, and I'll talk more about actual governmental regulation soon. But Facebook has done quite a bit, Twitter's done a bit, um, to try to mitigate the problem. But I hate to say this, in a lot of ways, they are attempting to fix the plane while the plane's being flown. And no one wants to be on that plane. These companies were built, as I've said again and again here, for different things. They weren't built for democracy. They weren't built for human rights. They were either built for, you know, they were built with privacy in mind. You could have anonymity, but for some strange reason, you couldn't also have safety and security. Why can't we have both? Why can't we design platforms that have both? Both things are important. Activists use anonymity to, uh, you know, hide themselves, and I've said that in Saudi Arabia. And, and but, but also, we need to have privacy for the sake of our own lives. Regular people need privacy online. It shouldn't be the case that we have to give up privacy for our own safety. And so we need changes here. The social media companies, uh, uh, actually Facebook two days ago, made a change concretely to ban deep fake videos on their platform. That means that they're banning videos that are artificially uh, doctored using what's called GAN technology. Um, generative adversarial networks. Basically what happens is you take a ton of images of a person, so you have a ton of images of yourself online and we get all those images and then we can create almost every facial expression you would make. And we can make you say or do things that you never said or did. Um, and that technology is out there. Uh, but the problem is that 
The picture of Obama shaking hands with the Iranian president that circulated a few days ago was not a deep fake. It was probably created using Photoshop. And it went viral, right? The video of uh, the Iranian missile that was launched against the Iraqi bases a few days ago was actually from 2017. It was just an old image. The video of Nancy Pelosi that made her seem like she was drunk was just slowed down. Same with the, Acosta, the Jim Acosta video on CNN that made it look as if he was a harassing or assaulting an intern when he grabbed the mic and he got his press credentials taken away. That was, that was sped up. And Facebook's basically said that it's not going to do anything about these kinds of videos. It's divested itself of responsibility for these kinds of things. If I had a dollar for every time over the last few years I'd heard a social media or a technology company say we're not the arbiters of truth, I'd have thousands of dollars, if not tens of thousands. This phrase, we're not the arbiters of truth. Let's unpack that. You have algorithms that prioritize content that people see. You decide how information shows up to people. I would say that's pretty close to arbitrating truth, you know? You have trends that tell people what they should pay attention to. Up until very recently, you had breaking news prioritized. The day of the Parkland shooting in Florida, David Hogg character actor was one of the main trends on YouTube. Videos circulating on the front page of YouTube were purporting to show that David Hogg was a trained actor. That's arbitrating truth in a way that is very dangerous, okay? They have to take responsibility. And, and let's be clear, I'm not saying that social media companies need to be in charge of all of the information we see. I don't think that that's a good idea at all. I do think they have to take some responsibility. And I don't know quite what that means just yet. Maybe it means them giving money, again, to the civil society organizations that they do not compensate to do this work already. I would feel a lot better about that. Maybe it means them supporting research with no hand in the research, no ability to say what gets found or anything so that we can actually, people like me, can verify what's actually going on. We can audit the algorithms, so to speak. Maybe it means that they work together with governments to actually generate sensible policy, because right now they're failing on their own. And that gets me to the third group, and sort of uh, if those things that I've just talked about are the medium-term solutions, these are the kind of long-term solutions because of the political environment we're in today. We've got to have policy and regulation to prevent what we're seeing happening on social media. And right now we have basically none. In the early 2000s, the Federal Elections Commission basically decided they were not going to even look at digital communications at all during elections in the United States. So they'd look at TV, they'd make sure that nothing illegal was going on there, same with radio, same with books, but they wouldn't look at the internet. And so what's happened? The internet has, has began as the Wild West and it stayed the Wild West. When I talk to people that make and build bots, what they tell me is they tell me I can get away with anything online. We can do anything because there's no laws, you know? Like as long as we're not attacking, say, like I said, protected groups or something, we're fine. The FEC is not gonna go after us. Like we can pose as voters and say a bunch of stuff and no one will ever care. That's gotta change. Right now, the current political appetite for this is next to nothing, bipartisan-wise. Um, but there are people in Washington who are doing this work and doing it really well. Senator Mark Warner's office has generated some super great policy and it has it sort of in it, they have it in their quiver, ready to be shot out when we actually have a Congress that will pass something sensible. Um, and I've helped with a lot of these, these things and so have many of my colleagues who are really, really brilliant. Um, and so I have a lot of hope that when we actually have a Congress that can pass some laws, that are sensible, that we will actually have some really good regulation. But apparently, and unfortunately, this is a long-term goal right now. In the meantime, we can look to states, and we can look to cities. Seattle itself has its own policies about the spread of dis and misinformation during elections, which are really cool. Uh, the state of California has tried to do some policy around this stuff, and you know they failed a few times with uh, anti-bots bills, things that are a little too far-reaching, but they will get there. What we need most, and you know, I'm getting towards the end of my spiel here with you, and we'll get into some questions in a second. What we need most of all is public interest technologists. 
In the 1950s, the Ford Foundation made a decision that they were going to invest in what's become known as public interest law. It was pretty hard to get people that were graduating from Yale Law or from Berkeley to go work at nonprofits defending people who had no money back then. The law was something that only rich people had access to, and to some degree it remains the same, although there are amazing public defenders now. There are people working on behalf of people with little to nothing. And we need to do the same with technology. We can't have the best and brightest students from University of Washington leaving UW and going straight to Google and Facebook and Microsoft just to make money because they've been sold some line that Google's a company that does no evil or that Facebook moves fast and breaks things and is cool to work there. We can't have that. We've got to make it possible at, at our universities, centers like the new center that's opening at University of Washington are key, to train young people to be able to go into public interest technology. We need people, we need people that understand the mechanics of technology to help write these le legisl this legislation, to write the regulation. When Mark Zuckerberg appeared before Congress, it was like a weird episode of Mr. Magoo. <laughs> like, uh, like the senators that were talking were asking things like, one of them said, so is Twitter the same as what you do? And another one said, another one said, how, how exactly do y'all make money? And Zuckerberg's like, well, the hearing is Facebook and political ads. We sell ads, sir. <laughs> you don't even know how they make money and yet you're supposed to be interrogating them on political advertisements and the problems that were around in 2016? I mean, come on, you're a senator. Well, you know, unfortunately, you know, these guys don't, those folks don't know how the technology works and that's a major, major problem. And we can change that and we are changing that. It's happening now. It's happening now at UW, it's happening at Berkeley. I was at Stanford a few days ago and there's some actually great stuff going on with training of young computer scientists. In the meantime, however, it is paramount that we look to countries like Germany, which has actually built legislation to do more than just fine technology companies, a little bit of money. Five million dollars to Google is not a lot of money. You can find them all you want, but we need criminal penalties for what's going on. And so, with that, I think there's an idea I wanna end on. And uh, it's the idea that what we're seeing is a recreation of the institutions uh, in our world. What we're seeing is sort of a reinvestment of individuals in concepts like the truth. Every time I go to do one of these talks, almost every time someone says, so don't be that person. Someone says, how do I know if something's true? I'm like, oh my God, you know, this is like, you know, this is a great question. They say, how do I know if something's true? How, how do I know that the person who invented XYZ vaccine wasn't paid by Big Pharma to invent the vaccine? And that's a damn good question. But the thing is, we've done a lot of work to figure out what science looks like. We know that empirical work, actually observing something, is the best way of actually generating knowledge. We know that the scientific method is the best way we've developed yet, and we need to continue to rely on it, but we have to hold ourselves and scientists accountable. And we'll do that. So, what does it look like to actually think about democracy and the changes that are ma being made right now? What will institutions look like? Should we all be really worried? I don't think so. I think, I think things are gonna be okay. And I looked to someone named Betty Reed Soskin. Does anyone know who Betty Reed Soskin is? She's a, 90, a park ranger in their late 90s, and uh, in her late 90s, and she's phenomenal. Uh, I highly recommend you look up her YouTube videos. She's at the Rosie the Riveter Museum in San Francisco, and she gives a talk weekly that was one of the most inspirational things I've, I've ever seen. It brought me to tears, genuinely. And she said this, every generation I know now has to recreate democracy in its time because democracy will never be fixed. It was not intended to. It's a particip participatory form of governance, and we all, have the responsibility to form that more perfect union. Thank you.
Hey, how's it going? Uh, first off, I'm really glad that there are people like you in this world. Thank you. <laughs> that are researching this and really trying to open up this space. But I, one of the things that kind of concerns me or confounds me is that um, a lot of this, this whole problem space is sort of built on a premise that people care what is true. Yeah. And let me say that a little bit different, that yeah, if yeah. given between an article that I can read that supports my existing opinion mm -hmm. versus one that I know that has been fact-checked and truly, truly mm -hmm. factual and mm -hmm. maybe balanced, people will always gravitate towards that article that already supports my existing mm -hmm. opinion. So how do you kind of challenge, you know, kind of challenge human nature? Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent question, and, and it's a complicated question. I actually just released a report yesterday with a colleague of mine named Katie Joseph um, on what we call the demand side drivers for disinformation, and it's on the psychology of disinformation. It was with, uh, so it's, uh, you can find it for free on the National Endowment for Democracy's web, uh, website. Um, and what we talk about is exactly what you're saying. So people actually like really want to engage with this information and they actually want to engage with things they already believe to be true, even if they know that they're like actually completely un incorrect. There's a reason that people believe that the earth is flat still and it's because they're willfully ignorant, right? Um, but there's something that I actually said in an interview today and that was, uh, you know, that, um, that if disinformation is the wave that we're all experiencing right now, if disinformation is sort of a tidal wave and it's overwhelming all of us, then polarization is actually the tide. And we need to be looking at tidal movements. So polarization is a major problem in this country right now and it's a big part of the problem that you're kind of speaking about. Uh, the reason why people believe what they want to believe is because we're so polarized. And the fact that I've seen throughout the six or seven years of doing this research are that the people who spread computational propaganda want us to be polarized so that we continue to believe the same things. It's gonna be a lot of work to dig ourselves out of that. The Center for Informed Public at University of Washington, uh, my, the center that I work at at University of Texas called the Center for Media Engagement and a number of other centers in, around the United States have, have, have recently been given over $30 million to fight polarization. And so we're doing that work. We're doing it. We're gonna make it happen. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, do you consider Fox News to be propaganda? Yeah, I mean, how could you not? You know, like, I, like F Fox News, Fox News is, is, uh, is, is biased media. Um, there's, you know, there's no real analysis that you could do that would show that it wasn't politically biased. So, and, so if the goal is then let's clean up propaganda and you get Facebook to clean up its act, are you still left with one, use the term legacy media, that's very much what Fox is, um, you know, them reaching half of America, like is that problem still there and are the solutions for fact checking and misinformation gonna address both the tech side and the legacy, legacy media side? Look, you know, the internet is what I call hybrid media, right? or well, actually Andy Chadwick, an excellent researcher in England, calls hybrid media. It's the coalescence of TV, of radio, of books, of all of these things together in one format. Fox News gets viewed online to a tremendous degree. And if you don't think that limiting Fox News' ability to spread disinformation on Facebook wouldn't have an effect, then I am sorry, but it's wrong, you know? Like, so I think that it will have an effect, absolutely, not just on their bottom line, but upon the way that news gets generated. I also do think, though, that we need to, while also limiting the propaganda that gets spread online and offline, again, to have media literacy as a requirement in schools, to have people engaging with things like critical thinking well before they get into college. And right now in America, that's not the case. That is not in our public education system. Thank you. Uh, thank, you thank you for coming. Uh, one quick comment, uh, a quote from Dr. Daniel Dennett. Mm -hmm. The best source of truth on any subject is well-conducted science. That's from his book, uh, can't think of the title of it. Have you given any thought to how much it would cost and what kind of an agency or an organization would be required if somebody outside of Facebook or Twitter or any of these companies were to try and do the task of policing them? Because mm -hmm. it strikes me as something that would be massively costly yeah. and so unwieldy as to be ineffective. 
Yeah, I've given this a lot of thought, actually. So uh, last year before I went to University of Texas, uh, I was in Washington, D.C. as a fellow at the German Marshall Fund. Um, and uh, German Marshall Fund's a think tank. They have this thing called Alliance for Securing Democracy, which actually tracks propaganda and, and does some really great work. I myself was working with former Ambassador Karen Kornblue. Um, and also last year, at the same time, I was working with um, Anne Ravel, who's the former chairwoman of the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission. And Anne and I have had a lot of discussions about this, and, and Karen and I have talked about this a lot too, and the conclusions that we've come to are kind of like, they're dual conclusions. One is that there needs to be a new agency uh, that, is, that is created to actually police the online sphere, much like the FEC or FCC. The other is completely contrary, <laughs> the other idea, which is that why would we rebuild institutions we already have? The Federal Communications Commission and the Federal Elections Commission are actually meant to be doing this job, and so maybe we need to reinvigorate them and actually recreate them in a way that actually uh, has them looking at the online sphere. And so uh, this work is actually being done and um, you know, without letting the cat out of the bag too much, there's actually bills that are being written towards this end. I don't think they'll be passed for several years. <laughs> do, you think, do you think we'll be able to do that and protect free speech? Yeah. Yeah, those things aren't mutually exclusive. We can monitor for, prop, for disinformation and propaganda while also touting free speech and holding up free speech. I think that we've been sold the line that things like free speech uh, versus censorship, you know, like we can either have one or the other, and I don't think that that's necessarily true. I think that that's a very simplistic way of thinking. I think that's black and white, and it's, it's not the case. So safe, let's, let's have you, and then we'll go over here. Oh, um, thanks. Um, great talk. Thanks. Um, so bots are creating, uh, you could say, a marketplace for fake engagements. And uh -huh. in a certain way, they're creating a lot of new jobs. Uh, so for instance, in Latin America, they've opened up a bunch of uh, bot farms that are actually employing a lot of people. Um, do you have thoughts on uh, ways that we could positively leverage these new marketplaces that bots are creating? Yeah. Absolutely. That's such a good question. Thank you so much. So the question is like, you know, how, how do we, you know, bots are actually useful tools. They're not just bad things. And so I think that like some people said, you know, including the CEO of Microsoft a few years ago, that bots were going to become the new apps. And like, you know, maybe that hasn't happened exactly, but at the same time, like bots do have a role to play in all of this. And I think that there's a good evidence, for instance, in Mexico, of people using bots to actually fight back against what's going on for fact checking. Um, I think that we need to invest in people who have, uh, who have training in, in things like democracy and human rights, but also in technology design to uh, scale these kinds of tools. Groups like Stop Fake in Ukraine have actually also been using tools like bots to verify content. What we don't want to end up with is just more and more noise, and so we have to be careful in how we do this. Another question I always get asked at talks like this is, why don't we just build pro-democracy bots? And that's not what I think we need to do, right? Like, I, I think that, uh, I think that you know, there's, there's a critical mass already of noise online. And so if we're going to use bots, we have to be very sensible and we have to abide by a code of ethics. And it doesn't mean that we'll just lose because, you know, if, for instance, the Rand Corporation wrote a report that said we can't fight the fire hose of falsehood with a squirt gun of truth. And I mean, I believe that, but, and so I do believe that bots can actually help us not to have to do that. But at the same time, we have to get clever about how we scale things and how we deploy them. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm really curious when you talk about designing social media for democracy, um, I'm curious what you think is the alternative reward system to the systems now that reward popular content and engagement in order to grow. Is it going back to like old internet forums with no peer-to-peer -peer boosting capabilities? Is it decentralized? Um, I don't know if you have any ideas on this front. That's a fabulous question. Um, yeah, you know, and it's the million dollar question. I mean, probably literally, it's the billion dollar question. I agree. Um, but, but uh, you know, if we're thinking about technology and technologists that have built systems that are actually designed with democracy in mind, you know, we can look to organizations like Wikipedia as an example. I know that, you know, Wikipedia is one of the top five most accessed websites on the web, right, worldwide. Um, the question is, can it scale? There's actually been great work but done by folks here, including Benjamin Mako Hill at the University of Washington, thinking about how Wikipedia looks in relationship to other websites. Um, we also have things like Mozilla, who or institutions like Mozilla, who actually have built some really, really fantastic tools, and, and they're companies with a conscience. Um, there's there's uh, 
organizations like uh, Mastodon, you have Signal. Um, there, there are companies that are being designed with this in mind. Actually, today I talked to Factal, which is a company here in Seattle that actually works to verify content and make sure real time that this bad stuff isn't spreading throughout the web. And so uh, I'm really heartened to think that you know, I'm, I can't really give you like the specifics of like how we design these tools. I'd love to brainstorm more, but uh, but I do think they're already out there. They're just sort of nascent right now. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, one idea I think is you know maybe to have uh, some of the incubators uh, actually force the startups that they're supporting to involve democracy in the design of tools. Hi. Hey. Uh, thanks for your talk. Yeah. Thank you. So I was just thinking about human nature and um, power and corrupted power and I was thinking about the practical application of assigning any certain people with the power to determine what is true and what is false yeah. and that seems to me um, always corruptible and always dangerous. How do you foresee not having that become a kind of ministry of truth mm. dystopia we give certain people totally. power over all other people. Oh my God, I think about it all the time. It has to be, it has to be distributed, right? It has to be distributed. And to we have to have checks and balances. To everybody? Not to everyone. Or well, maybe. I mean, that's people. the idea behind things like blockchain, right? Um, and there's new tools that are being developed that distribute the responsibility of verification of content to lots of people. The problem right now is we get back to this thing called an oracle, which is that we have to have one person that decides what's true and what's false, right? I have a PhD student who's doing a really cool project right now on uh, using token incentivized blockchain, uh, or sorry, token incentivized currency voting to um, to choose which journalistic entities are better or worse. But the problem is that a lot of people have way more currency than others. And so they're able to upvote Denver Marijuana News. And you know, suddenly the New York Times is at the bottom. And so the, 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 you know, you're, you're absolutely right. We don't want to invest Facebook with this power. We don't even want to invest the US government with this power. Um, but we do have journalists for a reason. We do have institutions like the Federal Communications Commission for a reason, um, and they can work in consort to do this better, in a better way. We need better new technology to actually achieve this, and it's coming, uh, but we don't need to make the same mistake we made with Facebook and Twitter and Google and think that these technologies are going to be solve all of our problems and that they're going to create utopia, because it's actually going to take human labor as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I guess... Oh, I guess that's all, my question is all related to that as well. Um, it's more a question of uh, free speech mm -hmm. and censorship than really anything else. Yeah. And there's org and with Facebook and Twitter being private organizations, uh, they've already hired other organizations uh, like the German Marshall Fund, the Atlantic Council, mm -hmm. to do their censorship for them. And they have the ability to take down Twitter pages and Facebook pages, this is not, you know, this is far more serious than just bots. So what, uh, alluding to what you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. what are you doing to encourage parallel public forums mm -hmm. like Twitter, like Facebook, so we can make them go away? So yeah. they will be accountable uh, to us and yeah. not be able to censor us. So that's yeah. far more critical than just a couple yeah. of annoying bots. Yeah, totally. That's a really good question. So a lot of my work is aimed at civil society, and it's aimed at these kinds of organizations, aimed at like getting them to think about new ways that they can get involved in this in a way that's not just aiding and abetting the social media firms in the way that you've kind of put it. And the reality, you know, like, there's a lot of really good intentions in this space amongst my colleagues who want to go in and work with the companies and actually do good. I myself was a fellow at Google Jigsaw for a year. Um, I tried to do that work and it was really, really hard. Um, it, it didn't work out. <laughs> I'm just gonna leave it there for my NDA's sake. But uh, it didn't work out, right? And so, and so uh, you know, giving talks at places like Stanford and going to Berkeley and encouraging young people to think about the ways they can build new platforms is really paramount, but also building public consciousness around these problems and writing books like this and getting this stuff out into the public sphere rather than just talking to other academics and rather than just going to Facebook and trying to tell them what they should be doing is really, really important. And that's why I'm here today at Town Hall, right? So you wouldn't do a, a government public platform is what I was referring to. A government platform. A government public platform that replaces it, that would eliminate the ability for them to censor. It would be subject to censorship, um, free speech yeah. laws. You know, I don't. Which 
Twitter and Google and Facebook are not. It's a novel idea and it's something that people have thrown around and there's been some op-eds about it. Um, just, you know, not until we get the public interest technologists that we need because anything the government builds online is pretty shit, so. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thanks for your talk. Um, if you don't know the answer to this question, maybe you can point me to somebody at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Washington. Washington that yeah. Does. yeah, sure. Uh, here we are in the first two weeks of 2020, and um, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, uh, Bitcoin, Ripple, Monero, all that stuff. You know any way to get those things anonymously in the you know, in here in the country? Um, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. I myself do not know. <laughs> but, uh, but there are definitely people at University of Washington who can help you on that. Um, there's a guy named Mark Frauenfelder, and Mark is a friend of mine. He was the, the original editor-in-chief of Wired, um, and he co-founded Make Magazine. And Mark has done a lot of work to help people at a very basic level understand Bitcoin and understand well, understand cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, anonymously. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we'll table that one because <laughs> okay. I don't really have your answer. And uh, and uh, I, I was going to say look to Mark because he's done some great writing on on these kinds of ideas. So, oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you Mark. have his email? Yeah. Oh, yeah okay. See me after class. All right. Hey, thanks for talking. It was great. Uh, I realize you. as I ste step up to the microphone that uh, the very first question kind of addressed this. So okay. I apologize if Go there's nothing it. new. Clearly, I just wanted to ask this question in my own voice uh, and hear that. But um, the flip side of all of this is that now that the cat's out of the bag and people know that there's disinformation and propaganda out there, it's a lot easier for folks to dismiss stuff and just say, oh, that's fake, that's fake, that's fake, that's, that's also right. fake. Yeah besides the media literacy and kind of combating polarization stuff that you've already mentioned, is there anything on the ground level that we can do to say, no, actually this is real, it's not fake to the folks who are quick to dismiss? Yeah, you know, you're never gonna convince, uh, like the other question, like you mentioned, we're never gonna convince someone uh, that what they believe is fake unless you know them or you have a close relationship with them. That's what the psychology shows. Mm. So a challenge for people on the ground is that when you have the, if you have those friends who actually believe things that are different than you, don't just engage with them on Facebook because the research, most of the research shows that engaging on Facebook is a pretty quick way to disagree. Um, but engage with them offline and have conversations. Uh, Joan Blades, um, uh, founder of many great organizations, has just started something in Berkeley called Living Room Conversations. And it basically what it does is it brings a Republican and a Democrat together to have pretty mutually exclusive ideas to sit down in two chairs and have a discussion about what's going on. And, uh, you know, call me old fashioned, but I still think that that's really, really important. And in fact, the lion's share of research supports that idea. And so we can have those kinds of conversations. We can do the, the challenging work of actually, you know, disagreeing and debating and keeping it civil. Um, the other thing, though, is that while people are becoming apathetic to whether or not things are true or false online because of what's going on, people are also becoming tremendously more aware. In 2013, we would not have been here having this conversation, mm -hmm. and we are. So I'm heartened. Thanks. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so you talked about three things, government, um, the big businesses like Facebook, and, um, and then individuals, but I didn't hear you mention journalism. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, there is a lack of accountability and ethics that has hit journalism mm -hmm. as a whole, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, you know, I think journalism has really struggled, no, you know, and it's no, it's no rocket science to say this in the last 20, 30 years uh, with the switch to digital, um, but also just with sort of the change in the way that politics is done, and maybe that's tied hand in hand with the way that we do our media now. Um, and so, you know, yellow journalism existed a long, long time ago, you know. There was, there's a long history of propaganda and promotion of fake things and disinformation. Um, the problem that we have now is that those tactics are now paired with the ability to amplify, right? And so someone that can pose as a journalist and write something that seems to be like journalism can then spread it to millions of people rather than it just going to their 10 buddies who are like nodding their heads, you know? Um, and so, 
yes, we do need to hold journalism accountable, but we don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We spent a long time developing actually some really great journalistic practices in this, in this world. And there's lots of really great organizations that are out there. I mentioned Pointer Institute. They're doing excellent work to train journalists. Neiman Labs at Harvard, um, places like ProPublica are actually doing investigative journalism. And increasingly, I'm happy to say, even organizations like the Wall Street Journal are training their journalists about how to stop and not spread dis and misinformation. There's programs there. We are woefully unprepared still in journalism to deal with this pro problem. Part of the problem is we're under-resourced. I actually wrote a report supported by the New Venture Fund for Communications um, last year on, it was a survey with over 1,200 journalists and we talked to them and the lion's share of journalists have no training in how to spot disinformation. They don't know how to do it. They have no support also for any kind of psychological trauma they come across in their work. I mean, we've got to change that. Like Google News Labs gave $20 million or a little bit more to journalism in a trust, right? To, or not in a trust actually, they gave $20 million, they're gonna give it out to journalistic news entities on their own regard. Why don't we make all of the tech companies give $10 billion in a public trust to be overseen by a variety of different organizations to be given out to news organizations or organizations like Wikipedia? That's what I think needs to happen in order to prevent what's going on from continuing. Thank you. Um, so we're just gonna take these last two questions. Okay, Thanks. great. Um, not all uh, institutions or corporations are within the United States borders, and while these initiatives in country are great, um, companies such as ByteDance are having a growing presence in the world, and um, do you know of any international initi initiatives or programs or things that people are thinking about to combat just offshoring Facebook or offshoring Twitter? <laughs> Yeah, that's a really, really great question. Um, one of the best organizations I know of and one of the ones that I tend to follow and think about all the time is the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. Mm -hmm. They're based out of uh, the Balkans and they're actually, they're, one of the guys that runs it's American, the other one I think is Bulgarian. And they were actually instrumental in the Panama Papers work. Um, they are zoned in on tech right now okay. and all of this kind of stuff. Um, you know, there's like the Bureau for Investigative Journalism in England. Uh, a lot of these people are old journalists who have realized that they need to switch their focus and investigative powers into journalism, into actually the corrupt practices of tech companies. Tech companies like Amazon that pay zero taxes and that use a lot of tactics to get around paying those taxes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I don't know if you all saw the movie The Report. Um, uh, based upon the uh, Senate Intelligence investigation into, uh, in, excuse me, enhanced interrogation techniques during Iraq war, basically torture. But uh, there's people that are much like the guy that you see in that movie doing work right now, deep, deep, deep investigation that's been going on for a couple years now to figure these sorts of things out. So if I was a technology firm, I would actually be quite worried. I'd like to come back to the previous question about news. I heard last week that glo war news about global warming is not of interest to people. So the, the media doesn't want to put it on because they can't run their advertising against it. Yeah. So we're not getting very much coverage about <laughs> global warming. That's a really great point, you know, and we're also not getting a lot of coverage about um, vaccination and things like that, which also have a lot of disinformation flowing. At the Center for Media Engagement, where I work at the University of Texas, we have a guy named Anthony Dudo, um, who has a PhD as well and, and is, is in charge of science communication. I would say that it's a problem that people don't like to read news about global warming, but I also think science has a communication problem. I think that science has to do more work to figure out how to package its work in a way that is translatable to the general public. There's a reason why I have a PhD and I'm not writing academic papers all the time. There's a reason why I wrote this book and it's because I think that we have a role as academics to actually enter the public sphere and have these kinds of hard conversations in a way that's digestible. Um, I don't know how we make things like global warming more palatable other than to have people that are very trustworthy, smart, and eloquent talk about them. Um, but then again, global warming is not my expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. <laughs>